How is everyone today? Great. Um, my name is Johan Ernst Nilsson, and I've been working, working with Exploration now for around 20 years. But basically, I'm 43 years old, so Exploration started when I was born. Um, every time you do something different in life, you change, you know, you, you adapt, you move forward. You will never reach a summit in life without taking some kind of risk. Risk-taking is a part of exploration, it's part of evolution. So what is actually exploration? I mean, it's a big planet, we can do a lot of geographical exploration, but also inner journeys. Exploration is to dare, to reach for the unknown, to step outside our comfort zone. Exploration is to move forward, to do something different. Many years ago, JFK asked a man at NASA, he said, what would it take to put a man on the moon? And the man said, the will to do it. The will to do it is kind of the base of everything in exploration. You really want to do it. You focus on something so particular that you focus on it 100%. And if you do that, you can achieve, you can turn the impossible into possible. So the will is the base, and also exploration is not a lot of people think that it's a, it's a geographical journey, but it's also an inner state of mind. It's the inner discovery of our own true potentials. The way we discover the way that we change. The way that we discover to turn the impossible into possible. Because for many years, the impossible was impossible until somebody changed it. Then the impossible became possible. Well, sometimes the, the geographical journey and the inner discovery meet. For example, this man, Shackleton, he wanted to cross Antarctica 100 years ago. And he wanted men to go with him, but he didn't want to promise sunshine because he knew there was going to be a lot of blood, sweat and tears. But he still wanted the men to go with him. So he put an ad in the paper saying, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, but honor a recognition in case of success. So, you think anybody wanted to go with this guy on this crazy journey, you probably never go, go back alive again without any payment in minus 40 in complete darkness for a few years. Thousands of people wanted to go with this guy into this crazy journey without payment in minus 40 in complete darkness. Why? Because they're crazy? No, because they're curious. They wanted to be a part of the exploration. They wanted to be a part of something different. So when I was a kid, I had this um, poster uh, in my locker at school of Buzz Aldrin. But he was a person that was just like on a poster in a locker in a school. He wasn't like a true person. He was only a poster. Then many years later, I got to know him and I understood that this is also a person. It's not only a poster. It's a person who had a dream. But the difference is that he pushed his dream forward. And he focused on the dream 100%. So instead of just saying that I have a dream, he said that I, I am going to fulfill my dream. And the person who said the sky is the limit, he didn't know there are footprints on the moon. I mean, we are setting our own limits. And every time we do something wrong, we push the evolution forward. We change. It's really important to dare to do things in life. Going back to my school again, uh, when I was a kid, I was hiding behind this wooden horse in the gymnastics because I knew that when they're going to pick people out for the football team, they're not going to pick me because I'm behind the wooden horse. And if I'm behind the wooden horse, I don't have to show the people around me that I cannot play football. So instead of learning how to, how to play football, I, I just hid behind this wooden horse. So this wooden uh, horse became a metaphor for like, you know, not to dare and not to push my limits and not to change, just stay within this comfort zone. It became an excuse for me, and I stayed within this comfort zone for, for many years, and I stayed within this comfort zone because it was, it was comfortable, but nothing happened. But then one day, I decided I want to move forward and do something different, step outside the comfort zone. So I, um, it all started actually when I was watching television, and. I had like, you know, a lot of bands that I was following, like Elton John and Depeche Mode, but I never really understood how to play the piano. And I asked my parents, how do you play the piano? How do you learn? Well, we have a, we have a piano, and you save some money when you worked at the amusement park in Stockholm so you can buy a keyboard. So I did, and I made a bet with myself. My first expedition was how to learn how to play the piano. 
Three years later, I was a pianist, and I traveled around Europe. I played down in the south of France. I played in the U.S. for a little bit of time, but mostly in Sweden. But I was not Elton John, but somebody paid me for something that I thought was impossible earlier because I didn't focus enough on my target. My parents said, focus, practice, and stay motivated. And with that, you can do whatever you want to. They never pushed me, but they never stopped me. So my friend said that, I mean, you, how are you going to become a piano player? You can, I mean, you can't play the piano. I know I can't play the piano, but that doesn't mean that I can't learn how to play the piano. The difficult part is not, to, is not to reach your goals. The difficult part is know what your goals are. Because once you know what your goals are, then you can just push your limits and you can go forward. But the difficult part is how to actually focus and find out what your goals are. So I was sitting at, um, at this um, uh, piano bar in, the, in Stockholm and I was like, you know, playing the piano. And my friend said, you happen to have an ear for music, but you can't put this in a different context. I mean, like something physical, for example. I said, I can take the same motivation strategy into anything I want to. I can become a doctor if I would like to, but I don't want to. Yeah, but you can't do something physical. So we made a bet. I would bike from Stockholm to the Sahara. I had a bike. I could bike a little bit, but I'd never been on a, like, that long of ex expedition before. So I threw up the first day. 52 days later, I was in the Sahara. I made it. I got home again. And um, I started to think, like, well, I could play the piano. I could bike to the Sahara. Are there more things I can do in life with the same motivation strategy? When I give my long lectures, like four or five hours, we have this wall philosophy that, that we talk about. It's a brick wall. So can I walk through this brick wall? Well, the first answer would be, no, it's a brick wall. You cannot walk through a brick wall. My answer would be, I don't know how to do it. But just because I don't know how to do it doesn't mean it's impossible. If I would show an iPhone in the 1300th century, they would probably burn me alive. I would be a magician. I would be a wizard. But just because, maybe in one million years, we can walk through that wall. I mean, a couple of hundred years ago, if I said that we're going to go up in space, they said it's not possible. So maybe we can walk through this um, brick wall. Maybe never. But that's not an important question. The important statement here is that I don't know how to do it. But just because I don't know how doesn't mean that it's impossible. When I was kayaking from Stockholm to Africa a few years later, it um, took me six months. It was a long journey. But before that, they told me that you cannot kayak from Stockholm to Africa. I said, why? Because it's impossible. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't know it was impossible. Can you please tell me how and why it's impossible? Because nobody's ever done it. Interesting. So just because nobody's ever done it before, does that mean that it's impossible? So I started to think about a lot of things that like, you know, would have been, like, you know, would have stayed impossible if you just focus on that. Medicine, philosophy, exploration, technology, education, design. Things that would never have been changed if you just follow the people saying that, why even try? It's impossible. Would I have climbed the seven summits? Would I have, would I have actually have been on the summit of Mount Everest if I followed the people saying that it can't be possible? Would I have actually have done that? I mean, sometimes you have to go far to see how far you can go. Would I have been up with my flying boat across Europe? Um, a little bit of odd uh, invention, but... Um, would I, have, uh, would I have crossed Greenland that I've done twice now? Would I have done all these explorations around the world if I followed the people saying that why even try? It's impossible because nobody's ever attempted this before. Difficult, yes. Impossible, no. Hard, annoying, irritating, yes, yes, yes. Impossible, no. In my new book, I have a chapter called PPL, The Public and the Personal Limit. The public limit is what everybody keeps telling me the whole time that I cannot do it. The personal limit is what I decide myself if I can do it or not. And this also goes into dreams. A lot of people saying that I have a dream. But if you go down to details, it turns out the dream is too far away, even attempting. The goal is pretty close, so I'm going to try that instead. The difference between a goal and a dream is actually a goal is something that you know you can achieve. A dream is something so far away, so why even bother trying it? But my opinion is that you can actually fulfill your dreams by visualizing yourself. Date the dream, put a deadline on the dream and walk your way backwards again. Because you can actually achieve your dreams if you use the goals along the way. So when I was doing like my last expedition now, a journey from the North Pole to the South Pole, I wanted to 
take everything that I've done before, my inner state of mind, my inner journeys, but also my exploration, to use kites, to use the wind, to use uh, kayaks, to use bicycles, to use skis, to use all these things that I've done for 20 years, but use that in one exploration, one ex expedition. But also use the knowledge in fear, how to conquer fear, how to face the problems, how to learn how to work in, in a team, leadership, motivation, focusing, all these things I had to study for a long time to see how I can put that in a different perspective in this expedition. You see, the problem is not to avoid the problems, actually. It's actually to how to learn how to solve them and to deal with them. Because problems will always occur the whole time. You will always have problems coming up to you, especially when you walk across the North Pole for 1,100 kilometers with a 110 kilo sled. Of course, problems are going to occur. Problems are going to come up every day. The problem is how do you solve them? How do you prepare yourself for these problems before you even start. When I was, um, when I was walking through these um, areas, one day, for example, I had a really, really heavy day. We were walking for around 20 kilometers with a sled, and then after like 12 hours, whatever, we put up the tent, we go to sleep. Next morning, we wake up, and we have drifted backwards, almost the same decision, uh, position as we walked the day before. So we have to do the same distance the next day. You need motivation, because you have really no choice. You have to just go on and go on and go on. But when you want to give up, for example, when I climbed Mount McKinley in 95, uh, I just wanted to turn around because it was so heavy. It was my first mountain. But then I thought, if I actually make the summit and down again, maybe it will be worth it. It was. So when I come up to Everest and I have 54 hours of reaching the summit and back again, I knew from Mount McKinley that it was actually worth it once I pushed the limits. So, standing on the North Pole, I thought, maybe, if I look back on Mount Everest and Mount McKinley, maybe this is worth it as well. So, how do you stay motivated when the only, only thing you want to do is just sit down and cry? You know, when you're so tired, you can't move another step. Well, I know that when I've been so tired, I cannot move another step. If I move another step, I get another meter. So, no matter how tired I am, there's always a little bit more to do. So by dragging the sled for such a long time, my mind goes just like, you know, am I going to do this? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? I'm standing here today, and it was worth it. But at that time, it wasn't worth it, because I was so tired. But obstacles, opportunities in disguise. You learn from your problems. Again, this is evolution. Every time we do something, we learn, we adapt. We're not here today because all of the things that have been going right for millions of years. We're here today because all of the things that have been going wrong for millions of years. But we adapted, we learned, we moved forward. And also, in Antarctica, I mean, 2,400 kilometers over um, the ice sheet, of course, I thought that, is this really possible? Am I really going to do this? But, you know, you take another step, you move, you move forward, you move forward. Problems are knowledge. Knowledge is evolution. Evolution is to push our limits, and to push our limits, it's exploration. So every time we do these things, we move forward a little bit in evolution. So all these experiences I have during these years, like for example, sitting three, four days in the tent in Antarctica, in minus 30, without the windshield, then you have 40 meters per second hurricane. We're holding the tent for like three, four days, not to fly away, because flying away in minus 30 is very negative. So I thought, like, what am I going to do? I'm just going to sit here, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. So focusing has been one of the most important things that I've been bringing with me during these years. So coming down the last part, down to the South Pole, I had a broken rib, I had one bruised rib, I had a frostbitten nose, I didn't feel my, my feet for like three weeks, I had uh, 10 cracked fingers, and I had a um, wounded knee and an injured back. Was I tired? Yes. Did I want to give up? Yes. Would I give up? Never, ever. Because I knew that if I would push my limit even more, I knew that it would be worth it. But my, fr my frozen nose was almost gone, and my doctors told me that it would actually be the last. You see, I kind of like my nose. It's not the best nose in the world, but it's mine, and I want to keep it. So I felt like, you know, I do everything that I can to keep my nose. So I had like, you know, warm uh, cl uh, clothing around my nose the whole time, the last, the last part. So why am I doing this? Uh, crazy? 
Maybe. Stupid? No. Because actually, the higher the mountain, the more difficult it will be to climb up, but the more beautiful the panorama will be. It is hard to put up, you know, difficult goals. Blood, sweat and tears, but it's worth it. And it's possible. And I start to see also my, my true potentials, not only in myself, but also in other people. I start to see that, you know, from the beginning, I saw like the tip of the iceberg. That was what I could do behind this wooden horse. But also I saw other people. I mean, if I can't do anything, of course, the other guys around me can't do any, anything either. But then I started to, to see the whole true potential of what I actually could do. I started to see also that it was possible to turn the impossible into possible. So, going back to this wooden horse, I mean, what have I learned? Well, I've learned to see people in a, in a different way, to see the true potentials in people. I've learned to see uh, that you can create your own destiny. By stepping outside of your comfort zone, you grow as a person. You learn. Another chapter in my coming book, which is called The Answer is Yes, uh, it's called Knox. It stands for No Excuses. There is no shortcut to the summit of Everest. Hard work, focusing, a lot of focusing, motivation and strategy around it. But there's no shortcut. And that's the good part with it. Because if it was a shortcut, then it wouldn't be the feeling of reaching Mount Everest. And whatever your personal Everest is in life, it is worth it. It's blood, sweat and tears, it's difficult, but it's worth it and it's possible. So now, for example, I work 50% of, of my time with charity. So, for example, uh, a few years ago, I took 17 kids um, with different kind of diseases for an organization that I'm, where I'm ambassador called Minstora Da. It stands, it's like um, Make-A-Wish Foundation. And we took them up to, to Kebnekaise here in, in Kiruna. I'm taking a guy also that I'm coaching who's in a wheelchair, and, um, and uh, we're going to go to, to Kebnekaise again uh, next month. And I'm doing these lectures um, all over Sweden, but also all over the US, and some in Asia as well, for different schools all, all over the world. So I'm having this thing now that I'm doing in the US, where we have 100 schools, where I give one lecture, and it's connected with 100 schools, and it's about dreams. Fulfilling your own dreams, and then by my tools, uh, try to reach your own dreams, and we're building up a forum on the website where all the 100 schools can go in and interact with each other. And that's actually the beginning of a big project that I have. It's called Education 1000, 1000 schools at the same time globally. So NASA has a saying, failure is not an option, but failure must be an option, but fear must not. We must dare, we must uh, dare to move forward, to step outside the comfort zone, but most important, we have to understand that we can achieve the achievable. We can do the impossible possible. Thank you very much.